Hello, everyone. Um, today, we invite Dr. Shreya Andrick. Uh, she is a co-director and principal dermatologist at Northern Sydney Dermatology and Laser in Northridge, New South Wales, one of Australia's leading dermatology practices. She is a fellow of the Australasian College of Dermatologists, is on the board of the Australian Society of Cosmetic Dermatologists, and is an international fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology. She's incredibly passionate about skin health and providing the best care to her patients. Due to time differences, Dr. Andrick's lecture is recorded today. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we can post the answers on Twitter in the next few days. Thank you. about energy-based devices in medical dermatology. Um, so ooh, just to start off with um, a little bit about me. So as I said, I'm a consultant dermatologist. I was born in Sydney and um, then my dad got a job in Hobart, Tasmania when I was in year seven of school. And so then I went down to Hobart with my family, spent 12 years down there. I did high school and medical school there. And then I always knew that I wanted to do dermatology and that wasn't really going to be an option uh, in Tasmania. So then I moved back to Sydney with my now husband. Um, it's a bit different here how it all works. So um, I did um, my intern year and then the next following year after that is called your resident year, but you're not in a training program. Then I did two years of dermatology research and then four years of my dermatology training. Um, along the way, doing my dermatology training, I had um, my first child and then I had my daughter as I was sitting my exams. And so I now have two kids who are age four and seven. Um, I'm interested in cosmetic and laser dermatology and I'm very fortunate with where I work. Um, and in my spare time when I'm not working or running a business um, or being a mum, I love my Peloton bike and my Pel Peloton tread. So that's about me. Uh, this is um, my practice. This is where I work. Um, and we've got a really beautiful space um, in the suburb of Northbridge. This is our team. So the practice was um, started by uh, Dr. Dawes Higgs here and Dr. Nina Wines 15 years ago. And then I um, became a partner um, in 2021. So we've got a team of um, 12 dermatologists um, who are all very skilled and have interests in various areas. So we feel like we really cover everything in the practice. So very lucky to work there. So going into my talk today, um, I know we've got a big range of um, people in the audience. So medical students, residents, um, maybe some consultants. So um, I've tried to kind of um, cater it to everyone. So apologies if some things are a bit basic, um, but um, hopefully we'll get a good overview. So firstly, um, looking at the layers of the skin. So we have the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous tissue. Um, the epidermis is divided up into five layers, um, with the very top layer being the stratum corneum. And um, I'll, I'll be mentioning these throughout the talk. So I just wanted you to have a bit of an idea um, of where we are, um, you know, in terms of what level of the skin we're at um, when we're talking about different devices. So what are energy-based devices? Um, these are tools that utilise various forms of energy, such as light or radio frequency, to treat a wide range of dermatological conditions. Um, it's important to be aware of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is a range of all types of um, EMR, and that goes from very long radio waves to very short gamma waves. So what's um, important for us here is that ultraviolet to the infrared range. Now, visible light is a narrow spectrum, which is 400 to 700 nanometers of EMR that the human eye can detect. Uh, visible light accounts for about 50% of solar radiation reaching the Earth's surface and can be further divided by color and wavelength. 
Ultraviolet radiation, which is 10 to 400 nanometers, comprises about 5% of solar radiation reaching the Earth's surface. UVC and extreme UV are filtered by the atmosphere. And then infrared, which is our 700 nanometers to one millimeter, comprises the remaining 45% of solar radiation that reaches the Earth's surface. At NSDL, we've got um, a wide variety of wavelengths, which means that we can treat pretty much any, anything that comes our way. So um, I'll be mentioning some of these numbers as we go. So LASER is an acronym for light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. The initial working term was light oscillation. However, LOSER was not um, an acceptable acronym. So switch over to LASER. Most medical lasers are heat driven and the laser's um, energy is absorbed by a particular target or what's called a chromophore. Um, laser light is monochromatic, so a single color and collimated, which means that it travels in one direction. So um, the theory of selective photothermolysis is basically how lasers work. And that's where you um, select a specific band of light and by using a specific energy level, you can treat various pigmented lesions, um, acne scars, unwanted hair, blood vessels, and a lot more without thermal injury or damage to the surrounding tissue. So this um, diagram here is quite helpful at kind of outlining that. So um, along the red line here, we've got, hopefully you can see my mouse, um, we've got oxyhemoglobin. Then we have pigment and there's another one for water normally. Um, now, if you look using this as an example, we can see the dye lasers, which are 585 to 595 nanometers. Now they target hemoglobin and you can see that that peak there is far enough away from the melanin um, curve. And the reason that's important is because it makes it much more specific for treating red things. So we don't want to um, attract, we don't want the laser to target the pigment, we just want it to target the redness. So at that wavelength, that's the perfect um, wavelength that you would choose for that specific indication. Now we move on to types of lasers. So as I was mentioning before, vascular laser. So the target is the oxyhemoglobin. And there are various wavelengths that can be used, including 532, 595, and 1064. These are used to treat red things, so rosacea, vascular birthmarks, um, anything that's red, basically, um, will likely be able to be treated with the vascular laser. Now, looking at this diagram here, we can see that smaller, more superficial vessels are better treated at that 532 and 585 to 600 nanometer. Um, whereas if we have larger, deeper vessels, then they're better treated at this 1064 nanometer wavelength. Then we move on to um, ablative lasers. Um, and basically, sorry, these um, work at removing the, epi the, we've got ablative and we have non-ablative lasers. So ablative lasers work at removing the epidermis um, whereas non-ablative lasers, you're not removing the top layer of the skin, essentially. So we've got ablative, we've got non-ablative. Then you can break it down into fractionated and non-fractionated. And fractionation is where you target the therapy to specific fractions or columns of skin within the targeted area, which minimizes the risk of adverse effects and it hastens recovery because you've got normal tissue in between. The so chrome for this is water. This diagram better explains it. So you can see here that we've got full field ablative resurfacing where you're essentially carving out, um, you know, the epidermis there. Then we have non-ablative laser, which is delivering heat. Then we can fractionate it. So this is literally drilling columns into the skin. And then um, non-ablative fractional is delivering heat in co um, columns in the skin. So the non-ablative fractional lasers create microchannels, which are called microscopic thermal zones or MTZs of damage within the skin. As the laser travels through the skin, it causes the water in the deeper dermal layers of the skin to heat up. And this is done in a controlled manner. So rather than causing the water and the surrounding tissue to vaporize like an ablative laser would do, 
the temperature increases, it tightens the existing collagen and it also stimulates the production of collagen and elastin, which thus stimulates dermal remodeling. And then, like I said, these channels are surrounded by normal healthy skin, which means that the non-ablative laser treatments are far less invasive than ablative lasers. Some uses for resurfacing I've listed here, scars, rhinophyma, laser-assisted drug delivery and benign skin lesions. And I'm just going to touch a little bit more on laser-assisted drug delivery. So this is um, a method that's being used more and more um, to enhance the topical delivery of drugs. So the stratum corneum, which is that very top layer of the epidermis, is quite a tough barrier and it's um, lipophilic in nature. So it likes anything fatty. When we apply laser to the area that's treated, creating these micro channels in the skin and then to apply something topically, it means that we can get in deeper and that in effect increases its efficacy. And um, it's been done a lot for things like keloid scars and actinic keratosis just to improve the efficacy. But there's also some more, some evidence coming out that's showing it can be effective in treatment of melasma, vitiligo, um, alopecia, acne, um, and onychomycosis. So hair removal lasers, um, these are generally 755 nanometer alexandrite or 1064 nanometer NDEAG. 1064 is preferred in darker skin types. Um, the laser light is absorbed by the pigment, which is in the hair, and that is then converted to heat. The next type of laser I'm discussing is um, our very rapidly fi um, firing lasers, which we use for pigments. So we have the Q-switch nano and then the picosecond laser. So um, Q-switch lasers fire at, in, um, at one billionth of a second, whereas picosecond lasers fire at one trillionth of a second. So they fire really rapidly and that minimizes the amount of heat that's transferred to the surrounding tissue, reducing the side effects. These lasers tend to be more photoacoustic rather than photothermal, which means that they send sound waves under the skin, which um, then go down, shatter the pigment that's under there, and then the body comes and munches it all up and takes it away. Both of these are safe to use in most skin types, although you always have to be careful in darker skin types with any laser treatment. And um, they can be used for tattoo removal, pigmented lesion removal, melasma, skin rejuvenation. Moving on to other energy-based devices. So um, intense pulse light, this delivers diffuse multicolored light, which is different to our lasers, which deliver single light that is in a column. Um, and we can use a variety of filters to, kind of, to determine our um, target. So um, the importance of using the appropriate filters or the treatment heads um, is because it allows the delivery of the correct light for a patient's skin color and for the specific target. When we compare IPL versus laser, this diagram basically shows that laser emits a single wavelength um, of focused light, whilst IPL delivers multiple wavelengths at once of scattered light. The laser light is of a single color, um, so that is called monochromatic, and um, it's also a single wavelength. Um, that flows in a single direction. Laser light has low divergence, meaning that the emitted light travels parallel and, syn and synchronic manner rather than propagating outward. Whereas IPL uses multiple colors of light, um, so it's called polychromatic, and the light is also made up of multiple wavelengths traveling in a non-coherent and a multi-directional manner. Next, we have LED, so light emitting diodes, and these are um, devices that emit light when charged with electrical voltage. Um, they emit a single colored light in a forward direction. And the benefits of this is that we can use it to treat a larger area of the head or the body at one time. It's low cost, it's effective, and we use it for superficial skin cancers, um, inflammation, skin rejuvenation, wound healing, and for acne as well. The common colors that we use are yellow, red, and blue, and this table just outlines the different wavelengths that we can use, as well as their indications. Photodynamic therapy is a two-stage treatment that combines light energy, so you can use um, the LED, you can use IPL um, or daylight to activate um, the treatment, 
and um, it's used to destroy cancerous and precancerous cells and can also be used for acne. So the way that it works is um, a cream is applied, the photosensitizer, which um, is 5-ALA um, or MAL, which is um, methyl amino aminolebulinic acid. And um, that is left on, this, on the skin, on that affected area that you're wanting to treat for about two to three hours. After that time, the cream is removed and then we use the light to activate the cream. So the photosensitizer is taken up by those precancerous cells and it's non-toxic until it's activated by light. After that light activation, the photosensitizer becomes toxic to the targeted tissue and that photosensitization lasts about 24 hours after treatment. Radio frequency is an electromagnetic device that uses an electric current to send heat energy to penetrate to the deep layers of the skin. The heat stimulates the tissue, enhancing the production of new collagen and elastin and causes skin contraction. This creates heat in a pyramid type shape. So there's more heat that's deposited deeper down in the skin than it is at the top. It's anti-inflammatory and it doesn't target any specific chromophores, so it can be used for all skin types. Phototherapy, I'm not going to um, discuss very much because this is very much a medical treatment. Um, essentially, it mimics the effects of sunlight exposure. Um, we use artificial um, uh, sources of UV light to trigger biologic processes to reduce epidermal proliferation, suppress the immune system, reduce the inflammatory process, and induce repigmentation in conditions like vitiligo. We use UVA and UVB. So UVA penetrates more deeply because it's a longer wavelength, whereas UVB is mostly epidermal. Eczema laser is essentially just um, targeted, more specific phototherapy, which can be done just for smaller areas. We use um, phototherapy in dermatology for things like cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, for eczema, psoriasis, vitiligo, and a number of other inflammatory skin conditions. So you can see in this patient here who has vitiligo, um, he or she is actually starting to repigment, and that's how the pigmentation starts coming through in vitiligo. You kind of get these little islands within um, the depigmented skin. Um, so that's a good sign for that patient. Now, um, just touching on potential side effects of energy-based devices. So number one is ocular damage. So you really need to be careful with eye protection for um, not only for the patient, but also the person performing the laser treatments themselves. Um, and you need to make sure that the eye protection covers the wavelengths that are being used. So not all goggles are the same. Um, also, you need to make patients aware of, you know, the kind of expected side effects as well as the ones that are more rare. So redness, discomfort, um, crusting, burns, reactivation of cold sores, um, dispigmentation and scarring, especially in ablative laser treatments. And you need to be super careful um, in skin of colour. You know, settings need to be modified. You may modify your choice of device um, in these patients. So I am breaking up um, the medical conditions uh, very simplistically. I'm breaking them down into reds, browns, and others. That being said, um, a lot of patients will have both red and brown and other going on at once. And so you may not necessarily just use one specific device for a patient. You might use multiple devices in the one treatment. So this picture here is um, it, from Tasmania. It's one of the beaches in Tasmania. Um, it's Bay of Fires, and Tasmania has the most beautiful beaches. So if you ever come and visit, then I highly recommend you go there. However, keep in mind, uh, it never gets too hot in Tasmania. So the beaches are pristine because no one really goes. Um, but, yes, very beautiful. All right, we're going to start with rosacea. So um, rosacea is a common inflammatory skin condition, and it predominantly affects the central face usually starts between 30 and 60 years of age, and there are four subtypes of rosacea. There's erythematotelangiectatic, which this patient here on the left has, papulopustula, which this patient has on the right, ocular, where it involves the eyes, and phymatous, where you get kind of overgrowth of tissue on the nose. 
Now, these um, subtypes can often be overlapping and some patients may have um, all four types at once or they may just have one or the other. Um, we can use lasers for all these four types of rosacea. So this is a patient of mine who has erythematotelangiectatic rosacea. This is characterized by a background facial redness as well as coarse telangiectasias. And these patients often describe blushing, which can be triggered by things like hot drinks, spicy foods, embarrassment, exercise. They also often report sensitivity of the skin. Laser is an excellent option for these patients. And the 595 nanometer pulse dye laser is my preference, but you can also use IPL. Um, three treatments are usually done. They're done about four to six weeks apart. Um, it's important to emphasize the chronicity of the condition. So whilst the laser treatments will help to settle their rosacea in the short term, they will require maintenance every kind of six to 12 months to stay on top of it. Next, we have papulopustular rosacea. So patients with um, this type of rosacea have erythematous papules and pustules, mostly affecting the cheeks, nose and chin, as well as the forehead. I tend to use medical treatment uh, for these patients. So my preference is doxycycline, 50 milligrams twice daily, if there's no contraindication, as well as topical ivermectin. Um, patients will often have a mix of papulopustular and erythematotelangic tap erythematotelangiectatic rosacea. So um, laser is beneficial. It's all, Laser can also be anti-inflammatory though. So um, a combination does work well. This patient, I think, um, I think this was just after one treatment and she was, and she was also taking the antibiotics, but she was so happy with the result. Um, again, I would do two to three treatments, four to six weeks apart. Um, but yeah, they get really nice results. Moving on to ocular rosacea. So these patients describe redness, burning, itchy, watery eyes. They get dryness. They will often describe grittiness or a foreign body sensation and can get things like blepharitis, conjunctivitis, and chalasia. Uh, IPL is often used by ophthalmologists for ocular rosacea, but medical treatment can be helpful too. It works in two ways. It constricts the blood vessels, which reduces the inflammation, as well as generating heat, which helps with the secretions. I personally would leave this up to ophthalmology to do though. So rhinophyma, this is characterized by hyperplasia of the skin because of chronic inflammation. Alongside low dose isotretinoin, CO2 laser can get excellent results in this um, type of rosacea. And essentially the tissue is ablated and literally taken away. So you can see this patient was obviously, he had great results. He was obviously very happy with his outcome. Okay, vascular birthmarks. So this is caused by abnormal growth or formation of blood vessels and vessel cells. And the two main types are hemangiomas or vascular malformations. Um, we can use vascular laser for superficial hemangiomas, capillary malformations, which are also known as port wine stains, um, and other kind of venous and lymphatic malformations. Uh, pulse dye laser and IPL can be used for more superficial lesions. And then your 1064 nanometer ND YAG for those deeper lesions. Um, if it does affect the eyelid, then intraocular shields are sometimes required. This patient, he's kind of um, midway through his journey, but you can see how the vascular laser is just helping to break up that redness on the chin for him. You generally tend to need to go harder for these types of lesions. So um, the end point that I aim for is bruising, whereas when I'm doing it for rosacea, my end point is redness. So you want them to walk out being a bit bruised. It will take a week or two to um, recover. They can get crusting and things like that, but as long as they're aware of it and they know what how to manage it, um, then they will get a better outcome if that um, if that does happen. Brown. So I showed this picture to my husband and he told me that the koala was grey, but this is a specifically brown koala. So um, they're very cute. Again, come visit. <laughs> so here we have melasma. Melasma is a common acquired skin disorder that um, presents with bilateral blotchy hyperpigmentation and it's also known as the mask of pregnancy. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to be hormonal in nature. We tend to see it more in Fitzpatrick phototypes three and four. 
And there are a number of factors that are implicated in the development of melasma, including things like family history, sun exposure, hormones, medications. Um, and there are a few theories coming out about um, various things which promote mel melanocyte activation. Treatment of melasma is not to go straight to laser. So um, you really need to emphasize the importance of sun protection in these patients. You want year round lifelong sun protection. They need to wear SPF 50 plus sunscreen um, every single day. They need to reapply it every two to three hours because the sun is a significant factor for melasma. If you can, discontinue hormonal contraception or HRT. And then of course there's cosmetic camouflage. So using makeup to cover it up. Next, we move on to topical therapies. So Triluma is a combination of 4% hydroquinone, um, tretinoin, and a topical steroid. And that I tend to use three months on, three months off, um, because there is a slight risk of ochronosis, whereby um, it can make the pigmentation worse before it gets better. Um, there are, Triluma is my number one go-to, but there are other topicals that can be used. In terms of oral treatment, tranexamic acid has been found to be helpful. Um, this has this would be a short-term treatment as well. You'd probably only use it for a few months at a time. Um, it does have um, potential side effects, including clotting and things like that. So just need to be careful there. Chemical peels can be done, again, with caution because you don't want it to go too far and go the other way. And lasers can be used with caution. So if we're using lasers for melasma, then the ones that you're going to want to be using are your Q-switched NDAG, your picosecond lasers. Um, Non-ablative fractionated lasers can be used, but you would want to choose a wavelength like a 1550, um, which goes a bit further into the dermis for any dermal melasma um, to help that in breaking up. Um, high risk of relapse. So strict sun protection, your hydroquinone, three months on, three months off. Um, in your off months, I tend to use tretinoin alone or 4% tranexamic acid. And um, so when I'm doing laser, I do five treatments separated by um, three to four weeks and then ongoing maintenance, which is every three months, just to try and keep that pigment at bay. And that tends to work well. Pigmented birthmarks. So these are, um, you know, lesions that develop at birth or appear shortly after birth. Um, they're usually harmless. And with this girl, she just didn't like the look of it. And so she came in with her mom and said, you know, she would like to have it taken off. Um, I discussed treatment with the Q-switch laser. And after just one treatment, she had an amazing result. So um, for her, I did use intraocular shields and she tolerated it really well. Um, but yeah, this was just one treatment, um, you know, it doesn't, it's not particularly painful. It feels a bit prickly on the skin. Um, over the course of about a week or so, it starts to crust up. We're using lots of Vaseline on there as it's healing. And then um, more or less a week later, it's sorted. So um, unlikely to come back, but if it does, then we can, we know that we can just treat it again. Nevis of Ota, nevus of Ito, Horis, Nevi. So these are dermal melanocytosis. Um, the nevus of Ota affects kind of the face periorbital area. Nevus of Ito is more on the torso and Horis, Nevi are required. Um, they tend to be more bilateral and more superficial. Um, so this photo was, was just taken from a study um, looking at Q-switch versus picosecond laser for treatment of um, the nevus of Ota. Um, but you can see how after six treatments, she's had a really nice result. Then moving on to our others. So um, photo here, iconic Bondi Beach. Um, it's a really beautiful place to come and visit. Um, you know, these pools here are always packed in summer. Um, so yes, highly recommend. Acne. So acne is a common chronic disorder that affects the hair follicle and the sebaceous gland. Um, it affects about 85% of people between the ages of 12 and 24, although can occur at any age. Um, various factors that contribute to its onset, including, you know, genetic background, hormones, um, cutie bacterium acnes, um, immune activation, and then that distension and occlusion of the hair follicles. 
Clinical features that we see in acne include open and closed comedones, which are our blackheads and whiteheads, um, the inflamed papules, pustules, nodules, cysts, um, and then they can get post-inflammatory red or pigmented macules and scars, and it can have significant social and psychological effects. Treatment includes um, topical treatments, oral antibiotics, hormonal treatments, isotretinoin, and then, of course, we have our energy-based devices. Um, you may use some of these in combination as well. So the 726 nanometer laser, we don't have this yet in Australia, unfortunately, um, but we're hoping to get it later this year and we're really excited for it. So this laser, um, the wavelength targets the sebaceous gland and um, has been found to be safe for all skin types and acne types. These patients have three uh, treatments done uh, four weeks apart. And then after destroying those oil glands, the acne continues to improve with time. It has been uh, compared to isotretinoin, which is really impressive. So rather than, you know, just comparing it to topical treatments and saying, oh, yes, it's superior to topical retinoids, um, they're actually saying that it um, is better than isotretinoin, which is fantastic because, you know, it can be hard to get some people to take isotretinoin because they've heard all the bad things about it and are scared to do it. Um, it bypasses the epidermis. You don't need any topical anesthetic or cooling. There's been no reported incidences of dispigmentation. Redness resolves within an hour. There's minimal downtime. Um, and after, you know, 12 months, 80% remained happy and clear. So um, this is something that you're very lucky to have access to already and that we're very much looking forward to having. Instead, I use my vascular laser a lot for acne. So um, this can be helpful for more inflammatory acne. It doesn't tend to do as much for your comedones, but, um, you know, it can help a little bit. Um, they do need multiple treatments. Normally I would do about three and they're done about four to six weeks apart as well. And you may need to do ongoing maintenance because, again, we're not destroying that sebaceous gland. Um, best done in combination with topical and oral treatments, but it, and it is safe to do whilst on doxycycline or isotretinoin. And um, there's minimal downtime unless you get to that bruising stage. So I tend to go all over in a single pass um, with kind of a lighter um, setting, and then I'll kind of target the individual lesions on a sub setting, um, and that tends to get quite nice results. Um, you can also use LED to minimize downtime afterwards. So patients who might describe swelling um, for a few days afterwards or bruising, then the LED can be helpful for that. So this is a patient of mine who I was pretty convinced I was going to have to put on isotretinoin because she did have cystic lesions. She has got um, some early scarring. However, she was turning 18. She was going on a cruise. Um, she wanted to drink alcohol and um, she really just wanted to put off anything until after that. This was her after two vascular laser treatments and she was doing that in combination with just topical, so nothing orally. And she's had a fantastic result. I'm very proud of how she's done. Um, and she, again, she'll probably need to do maintenance. I'm hanging out for the acne laser to come and then maybe I can just treat her with that um, and avoid anything systemic in general. This is another patient of mine. She was on um, isotretinoin and um, she just had a beautiful result with um, the combination of isotretinoin as well as vascular laser. I think this was probably after three treatments and her skin is essentially clear. Um, the benefit of doing the isotretinoin alongside it is that hopefully we'll minimize the chances of the acne recurring or needing to do further treatments. It's also minimizing the chances of scarring. LED can be used for acne, so blue light and red light can be used um, by decreasing, they work by decreasing um, C. acne's colonization, pore size and inflammation. Again, better for inflammatory than non-inflammatory lesions. Um, it's thought that the C. acne's produces porphyrins, which makes it more photosensitive, which can absorb the visible light. You can do pho um, photodynamic therapy as well, and that's been shown to induce long-term acne remission. Um, this is just a slide talking about photodynamic therapy, which we've kind of already discussed, but the photosensitizer is taken up into the pilospatious units. 
Um, and then we use our laser or light to activate it. So you can just use your red light, blue light, or your um, IPL. So the lasers that I've talked about will minimize the chance of scarring. And if you're treating scarring, then you do want to ensure that the underlying acne is under control. Acne scarring treatment is not one size fits all. And we really have to tailor treatment depending on the lesion type. Often we'll do multiple things at once and that will kind of help us get through that treatment faster. But when we're treating scarring, we are looking at kind of a 12 to 24 month period um, that it takes in order to improve that. So we have two broad categories of acne scarring. We have post-inflammatory changes, which can be redness or pigmentation. And then we also have contour defects, which can be hypertrophic, so raised scars, or atrophic, which are more indented scars. For our post-inflammatory changes, number one is UV protection. So again, um, very, got to be very strict with their sun protection, sunscreen every day, reapplying. Um, then depending on what type of, you know, if we've got hyperpigmentation, then you may want to use your pyrosinase inhibitors like your hydroquinone. Um, topical retinoids can be helpful as well. Um, vascular laser for the redness. And you, again, like I've said, you can do this whilst on isotretinoin. Um, nano and pico lasers for pigmentation. So this patient was just treated with um, topical hydroquinone. And she had a really nice result with that. You can see that if you just take the color out of the scars, then the contour defects are much less obvious. So um, she was just treated with topicals, but if it was more resistant, then you might consider um, adding in Q-switch nano or picosecond lasers. Um, it's been shown that post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation can last more than 12 months in 50% of patients and more than five years in 25% of patients. And so whilst it is more cosmetic, um, it can have a significant impact on patients' quality of life, how they feel about themselves. So if there's something that we can do about it, then uh, I feel that we should. When we've got those hypertrophic um, and keloid scars, you can use intralesional steroids and you can combine that with pulse dye laser or with fractionated laser um, to do kind of laser-assisted drug delivery as well. When we've got those atrophic scars, so the indented scars, um, the level of atrophy determines what treatment you can use. So we've got ice pick scars, box cast scars, and rolling scars. And um, you can use kind of a blade of laser for all of those. With your rolling scars, you're looking at, um, you can also use non-ablative lasers. You can use um, radio frequency, um, as well as various other methods. So um, this image just shows how we've used kind of deep pinpoint ablation for the more ice pick scars and then fractional ablation all over um, just to, you know, kind of blend it all in. The way that radio frequency works for acne scarring, that heat energy breaks down the scar tissue and it can then be remodeled, which reduces the appearance of scarring and can also break up pigmentation as well. It's a really good option for those with darker skin types. Looking at hypertrophic and keloid scars, so this is similar to, um, you know, regular you know, with those hypertrophic acne scars. Um, so for these types of patients, I tend to do combination pulse dye laser um, CO2 ablative laser, as well as steroids. So you can inject the steroids or you can do laser-assisted drug delivery. If you do laser-assisted drug delivery, you're, so you would do your redness laser first, then you would do your CO2 laser on top to drill those little holes in. And then you literally just rub that steroid on top and that kind of um, settles into those holes. And the reason we do that is because you get more uniform distribution if you do it that way, as opposed to injecting it, which, you know, it's not as, it's not as uniform. It's not going to um, produce that atrophy of the scar at the same level throughout. Hydranitis suppurativa, this kind of moves on from um, acne because we have the follicular occlusion tetra in which you get hydradenitis, acne conglobata, dissecting cellulitis of the scalp, and pyelonidal sinus. So 
It is a debilitating chronic inflammatory skin condition where patients get painful um, nodules, abscesses, and sinus tracts that will often lead to scarring. So laser and light dev devices um, have been used more and more frequently for this. CO2 laser can be used um, surgically for de-roofing and excising sinus tracts. And then also hair removal laser um, can be helpful by targeting the hair follicle and destroying the pilosebaceous unit. Um, again, I wonder if the 1726 laser would be helpful for this. I haven't seen any studies done on this so far. Um, so that could be an exciting space for these patients because it is an awful condition. Then finishing off with cancerous and precancerous lesions. So actinic keratoses, these are sunspots. Um, they're precancerous and there is an increased risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma if you have lots of actinic keratoses. You can treat lesions individually. So you can just freeze them with cryotherapy. You can shave them off. You can scrape them. Um, you can use electrocautery. But when we have field actinic damage, um, then again, you can use topical things, um, laser resurfacing or photodynamic therapy. Laser-assisted photodynamic therapy is 2.7 times more effective than traditional PDT. And it's also been found that non-ablative fractional laser, so doing a full-face non-ablative fractional laser, which can help with, um, you know, pigmentation as well as sunspots, this can help to reduce subsequent facial keratinocyte cancer. So um, it's a nice option for patients who might be a bit more cosmetically minded. Superficial BCCs and SCCs. So again, you can use topical treatments for these. You can um, curette them, you can excise them, um, or you can use photodynamic therapy. Um, this has similar efficacy to topical treatments. You do get a great cosmetic result. And um, this photo here is taken six months later from this patient. You can see that um, there's a bit of a scar from the biopsy, but otherwise um, it's healed really well. Um, when we're treating superficial skin cancers, we do two treatments done two weeks apart and um, you can activate it with red light or IPL and you can also do laser assisted PDT. Some patients just prefer to do this. They, they come in, they have their treatment done, we do it for them. Um, it is obviously more expensive than topical treatment, but some patients just prefer to do that rather than using a cream for six weeks. So um, it's a nice option um, cosmetically and it kind of takes the load off the patient. So that is the end of my talk. I'm sorry that I'm not giving this live, but if I were, then it would be 2 a.m. and that's not quite conducive to life. Um, I've got um, all of my contact details here. I'd love it if you reached out, if you had any questions, if you want to come visit, spend some time in Sydney, um, then, you, you know, you're very welcome to do that. Um, so please reach out. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it and I hope you have a great day. Bye. I'd like to thank <clears throat> Dr. Andrick for her very informative talk and for updating us on all the uses of energy um, based devices in dermatology. So again, if you have any questions, please include them in the chat and we can ask her and then get back to you all on Twitter in the next few days. Thank you.